the vector. If you just want to create a bunch of empty uh, elements or something, but since you can just do v dot pushback every time, it shouldn't really matter. Uh, would I do v uh, v bracket z bracket put dot pushback to push back something in that specific vector? Uh, you could do that. Well, it would just be v. Because this will actually get the element of type. VZ will just get the first vector. I know, that's what so I'm trying to get. Like, I want to push back V at Z. And I'll do what v I would recommend is you initialize a vector, uh, vector something type, do stuff with it. And then, and then add it to a vector of vectors. And then just add it to a vector of vectors. So it'll just be V. Yeah, that's probably a lot better. Yeah, so you don't have to deal with all that stuff. Has anyone finished the project? It started, um, but I'm, I'm kind of confused on what the game's supposed to look like. So I am not too, too far in. Too far in. But when does it do? Next Monday. What? What the heck? Why is it so late? Because we haven't really had a class to discuss it. It's not worth discussing. It's too easy. I'm just confused. Maybe can, like I, my question was basically, can you explain how the card game works? Because I guess I just don't understand it. OK. So there's a pile. And to begin with, there's a zero on top of the pile. So <clears throat> whichever thread has zero, plays it, right? And by playing it, all that means is it increments the top of the pile to a one. And then removes that from their the, the thread's hand. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not that, well, it depends on how you code it. For example, <laughs> If you sort, uh, if the thread sorts its own hand, then it only has to increment a, uh, an index. Oh, good point. So each thread would basically just be a player. That's where yep. you're getting it. Okay. Yep. Then I, maybe it was just because I read I read the documentation really late at night, but it makes sense now. <laughs> oh, great. I good. Want to ask about how I tried to do it which is uh you mentioned that if we have a local variable for whatever is being called and we're only using local variables yeah um and the things and the uh and the data being used to insert everything such as parameters uh, those are all local and threads wouldn't be able to uh, step on each other or no? Correct. A, uh, a variable which is declared on the stack of a thread is private to the thread. Um, what well, should I explain how I tried to do the uh, threading or not? I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, I hope it's not as bad as you as you thought it would be. Um, should I go through it like line by line or should I just give a general summary? Uh, well, how about a general summary? But first I want to know if uh, uh, Cephas has his mind reading hat on. What, He's what's muted on your head? Oh, this is uh, my bike helmet. And it's uh, uh, protecting you in the lab from what? <laughs> All the crazy radiation is trying to control our minds. Uh, does it have a tinfoil lining? Uh, yes. Good, good, good. I have one too. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Thomas. All right. Um, I set up local variables. I set up the mutex. I have a uh, while loop for comparing uh, an int to the size of however many we're doing. And the first thing I do within that while loop is it does a mutex lock. It uh, does a, it loops through the vector of uh, 
hints to see if they're equal to the current uh, thing comparing it to size. I. Why are you com what are you comparing to size? Well, you know what? This is too detailed and uh, it's your project. Uh, you know, if, if you want to. Uh, Schedule wanna, time. Yeah. Uh huh. Right. right I'll. I do have a general word of warning because I ran into this hiccup and it took me way too long to figure out. So when you're allocating, um, at least how I did it is I have one big vector and then I just split it up to the, each of the threads. You have to make sure that you are e allocating exactly right and not missing an element. Because I had one element missing, so the pile was never fully incremented. So it just loop on forever. And it took me so long to figure that out. That's a bug, right? Mm -hmm. So make sure when you're doing your mod and whatever else, do it correctly. Do it cor correctly. That's right. <laughs> okay, other questions about the project? Actually, I do. How extensive should this commenting be? Because I definitely didn't do it there for a while. Well, if you're if you're able to to look me in the camera and say I definitely didn't comment well, then maybe you should comment more. <laughs> I I should. Yeah. So yeah. I remember, folks, you don't you don't comment what you're doing. You're commenting what you're thinking about. You comment why you're doing things. Okay, everybody knows that I plus plus means increment I. Okay, uh, let's put out some uh, good vibrations for our colleague Nathan. Uh, Nathan got sick over the uh, uh, that very long spring break that we had. Ha ha. But uh, yeah, he's pretty. He's feeling pretty badly. He's, uh, so let's put put out some uh, warm and fuzzy vibrations for him. Okay. I, I guess Thomas is showing us that his warm and fuzzy vibrations emanate from his armpit. So no, I'm uh, throwing them to him. Oh, okay. Uh, looks like I've used up my tissues in here. Yeah. Uh, I'll be, uh, you don't need to see your. Ah, okay, I'm back. Welcome back. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, what, what if anything have I said about a final? Can somebody remind me? Uh, uh, we would have it. What? You have not said anything. Okay. Is there a final in the syllabus? Oh. Well. Yes, in the syllabus there is. Okay. Who even cares far, about the syllabus anymore? What? Who even cares about the syllabus anymore? We're making our own path. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with Cephas. Let's make our own path. So. Um, uh, let me look up the syllabus and uh, make some decisions based upon it. Uh, where would I find it? I suppose I need to go to my finder. Yeah, the Mac Apple names the finder the finder because you can't find anything. Uh, all right, so let's see. OneDrive. Carthage syllabi. That should be pretty easy, right? And uh, this is, what class is this? 3510, I think. 3510 spring 2021. There it is. That wasn't so bad. I found it pretty quick. Lee? Now I'm waiting for Word. I don't know, this is a really fast computer. I'm still waiting for Word to load. I might as well be on Windows 95. 
Uh, okay, so the uh, final exam is worth 10% of your grade. Uh, and um, uh, that 10%, uh, some 10% is considered to be extra credit. So um, I propose the following. Uh, it's hot and I'm cranky and uh, I'm projecting out to the day of uh, day after the final and uh, thinking that I'm gonna be hot and cranky on that day also. So I don't wanna grade it. Uh, so you all got hundreds on the final. Yay. What? Thomas is, th Thomas is th th saying to himself, ah, man, great. First hundred I've ever gotten in one of Perry's classes. <laughs> I've gotten more on an assignment or on in your class. Yep, yeah, it, yeah on, on an exam. My class. Wait, 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 wait. Can't give everybody hundreds. Yes, he can. Why yes, he can. See the can. Oh. <laughs> He's no. the department head. He can do what he wants. <laughs> no, like remove the final then. Can, can we uh, mute Cephas, no. please? <laughs> no. Keep the hundred, Cephas. <laughs> no, a hundred for what? Of none call. of us did. Can you just remove the final grade? And just like no. Nah. Give us uh, my suggestion would be you could take you could treat the final grade as extra credit. I well, think he doesn't want to grade it. it zero that's that's one. Fair. So just slash it. It's not worth any points. No, I think it's I no, think no, it's, no, 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 no. Giving everybody hundreds just artificially inflates their grade. Exactly. With work, they didn't. It does absolutely do. no harm. What do you mean there's no harm? But it's at the end of the day, if you're putting in the effort with the material, does the grade really matter? Because yeah, the that's grades what I'm saying. Just ignore the final. But what I'm don't, saying is if the grades in it. Like use the work that they did do, which is good work, I hopefully, and grade that, and then just don't include the final. I propose that we just completely ignore Cephas from here on. No, out. no, no. I think I'm making a good point here. I yes, think I am, Jordan. I think we should all get hundreds. <laughs> what? Why? And the, because and the if everybody gets a hundred, get... then nobody gets a zero. <laughs> okay, that is a, a way to repeat the same statement. Of course, if everybody gets a hundred, no one gets a zero. Actually, how about the only people that get one hundreds are the only people that actually show up to class? Ooh, no. Just I ignore. That, no, let's not do that. Dr. Let's, I actually like that idea. Of, what if it was based on attendance for class? A good yeah, chunk of people have people... been uh, just watching the videos. Um, oh, some people okay, have been then. sick and mind. aren't able to come to class, and I don't think they should be penalized for being sick. Well, I think one or two deductions should be fine, but like there's a difference between missing a week or two and missing half the semester. Yeah. Dr. Kovalovitz, why are you being so eerily silent? He's wanting us to have the conversation. He wants us to be the judge. The, what is it? Judge, jury, and execution. Say. He's what? Speak up, good say. Uh, he, no, he, he froze his uh, cam his camera and he's gone off to, walk, to get some popcorn <laughs> so he can listen to the <laughs> entertainment. <laughs> what say you, Doctor? Perry, I don't know what you So I say that uh, everyone except Cephas gets 100. All in a favor, raise the hand. <laughs> and Cephas gets a 25 page paper to write on, on the merit of uh, the move instruction. No bet. Actually, I don't have time to write a 25 page paper. Get out of here. Hmm. No, I don't, I don't, I don't understand giving them credit for something they didn't do. Removing the assignment, I can buy that. But saying 100 is just, it's credit where no credit has been done. Right, but isn't that like the, the byword of your generation? Well, I don't like it. 
Everybody gets an E for effort? No, E for effort is dumb and it makes people lazier. Just remove the assignment. I think that is the better idea. Then they'll get the grade that they get for work they actually put in. Okay, the, I'll, I'll give it some thought. The, you're what? the only person who's against the Cephas. <laughs> Why? It makes sense. Well, I your your uh, idea makes sense. I think he. I don't know. I think Cephas is it. It's not wrong. It's definitely weirder to me. Oh, yeah. But it is what it is. I don't. I don't. It doesn't affect my grade personally either way. I'm still gonna pass, but it doesn't affect mine either. But I. I yeah. I'm opposed to it at a principal level and that ladies and gentlemen is a micro in microcosm is the entire entire conservative mindset it doesn't affect me so screw everyone else so cephas uh, are are you uh the president of the young republican club um no i actually don't do any sort of politics <laughs> I mean, even, yeah. even if I had a terrible grade, I wouldn't agree with it because you're giving people credit for something they didn't do or attempt. Mm. Okay, I, I will take, uh, take your um, uh, input, everybody's input under advisement. And I'll come up with something which gives me less work. I mean, I both would give you the same amount of less work, just... Yeah. All right, I'll you're not doing anything out. in either case. All right. Uh, okay, good. Um, you know, uh, we'll we'll figure something out. Uh, all right. So, uh, where were we? What did we study uh, at the end of the last class? Not a, no idea. Let's consult the comp or the uh, GitHub. The GitHub. I, I didn't have the discipline to keep writing down our progress. Oh, yeah. I, every semester, I, I start out writing down the, our progress, and then I get bored with it. All right. Well, uh, it seems to me where we were. Uh, let's see. I think I have it right here. Okay, what is the name of this note? March 30th note. All right, let me bring that up. That's the March 9th note, March 30th. Okay, so this is what we did last time. Uh, share the screen. Okay, so this is what we did last time. We went over uh, the mutex as a review. We introduced lock guard and we introduced unique lock. Uh, unique lock is uh, a superset of lock guard. Both of them are smart objects. When they go out of scope, they do something good for you, namely, they unlock the lock. Okay. Uh, then I think we, uh, did we do the, uh, yes, we did. Uh, we did the uh, 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 counter that was nice and fast, but produced the wrong results. Then we produced a counter, multi-threaded counter that produced the right results, but was too slow. Uh, we talked about uh, Gene Amdahl, Amdahl's law. Um, and uh, Amdahl's law covers uh, what is the theoretical maximum speed increase? What the hell? Apple News just showed up for no reason. Because Apple, that's why. Uh, so uh, Amdahl's law says what is the uh, maximum possible increase in speed if in performance <clears throat> if you make your code paralyzable? And his formula takes some inputs, uh, the percentage of your code, which uh, percentage of applicable code uh, that can be paralyzed versus the percentage of applicable code that must be serial. And you plug those two numbers in and you'll get a maximum possible speed up. 
And uh, as you might imagine, the, the speed up is going to plateau so that uh, there comes a point where no matter how many processors you add, you're not gonna go any faster uh, unless you have something which I suppose, and this is the technical term for it, boys and girls, embarrassingly parallel. That is the actual technical term. So when somebody says uh, something is embarrassingly parallel, uh, means that the algorithm itself is inherently parallel and it's gonna be, uh, you're gonna get uh, pretty much a linear, uh, linear uh, performance improvement, add more cores, add more processors, add more threads and you get more, that much more uh, performance. Uh, we looked at a, a correct and performant way of doing this distributed counter. And the idea here is we introduced the idea of, um, well, in essence, uh, if we are allowing, if we allow ourselves a certain amount of, um, a certain but manageable amount of incorrectness, of approximateness, then we can make this, uh, this particular problem very, very fast. And the way that we did that is we had uh, local counters, which at the very end were summed up, rolled up. Uh, uh, OMP, which is the next thing that we studied, uh, does uh, calls it a reduction. Now, what I mean by allowing us, if we allow ourselves a bit of impreciseness is each, at any given moment, uh, some master control thread, uh, perhaps part of the GUI, could reach out to the threads and uh, sum up each thread's counter. Perhaps uh, each thread is, uh, has a, uh, a data structure, which perhaps it's a class, and maybe there's a method that says, what's your current count? And uh, so even though it may not necessarily be exact, uh, it'll be close. And uh, when all the threads are finished, of course, the end result is exact. It's the, it's the value it's supposed to be. So this is actually kind of a design pattern. So remember it, remember this idea. The idea is that if you allow yourself a certain amount of inaccuracy uh, while a process is, while a calculation is in progress, then in essence, you're giving yourself a performant way of doing, let's say, uh, a progress meter. You know, you're 68% done, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, the only number that really, really counts is the 100% done, and that's when everything is going to be uh, fixed up to be uh, completely accurate. Is that a cool idea? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, you know, I don't know if you explicitly went over this, but in my project, I used parts of the vector of my main vector because they were all like uh, split from it. So I had references in each thread to um, a data set that was on the main program stack. So, but they weren't accessing anything uh, at the same time. They're just accessing different parts of memory, but I guess with the same chunk, is that acceptable practice or is that? Yeah, so your intuition is in keeping with the uh, one of the ways to make a, uh, uh, a more parallel algorithm is to dole out private copies. Well, in your case, they're not private copies so much as an agreement by the programmer, by you, the designer, that each thread will stay, so to speak, in its own lane, right? So each thread will uh, preoccupy or occupy itself with its uh, some portion of the bigger vector, but never look outside its own portion. That's correct. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the only place that that's fine. The only place you can get in trouble is if you are uh, unknowingly making changes to that vector. For example, uh, if everyone was sharing the, uh, the same vector, uh, but just different portions of it, 
and then somebody decides to uh, uh, remove a value, then that's going to screw up everyone. Ah, yeah, I just set it to negative one. So I didn't delete what? anything. So like when an element was taken, I changed uh, the value okay. to minus one. Right, right. So deleting yep. is inefficient. And right. Yeah, that would that would change a lot. Yep, yep. So uh, your intuition is good. Here, lean lean closer to the camera so that I may validate you. Thou art validated. Okay, do you feel validated now? Good. Uh, we looked at um, uh, OMP, which is the uh, open multiprocessor. Uh, OMP is one of the older established methods whose goal is to take ordinary code and somehow magically parallelize it. And uh, OMP does actually a pretty good job. Uh, it's got a lot of uh, capability. And uh, the OMP itself, you have to do an include. OMP.h and on the Mac you have to include it as link it as a uh, framework. Um, and um, in Visual Studio, all you have to do to use OMP is to turn it on in the project settings. So in Visual Studio, not code, there's a um, under project settings language code generation. I think there's a checkbox that says enable OMP. And that's then you include the file and you're done, the header. Uh, OMP works uh, using pragmas. Uh, and a pragma is a command to, essentially it's a command to a, a program other than the compiler. Now we're accustomed to pound include or, or pound this or pound that. And those are all commands to the preprocessor. The uh, pragma is, uh, is a generalization of that idea. So uh, typically it would be OMP uh, for talking to OMP and then other commands. Now OMP is actually surprisingly rich. Uh, you can, uh, uh, some of the keywords are uh, parallel uh, for, and the very next thing below it would be a for loop. OMP knows how to parallelize loops which are based on integer types. Okay, so, um, you know, does it know how to do a while loop? No, doesn't know how to do a while loop. Uh, so any loop that you write that starts like for, you know, int i equals zero to something, OMP understands that kind of loop. Uh, there are other keywords in OMP like private, and then you give a list of variable names or the variables that have already been declared. And private means that any of the variables in that list will be uh, made duplicates of so that each thread gets its own version of it. Once again, the idea is we want to be able to parallelize code without modifying ordinary code. Uh, there's also, um, let's see, shared. Uh, there is a reduction where you do an operator, colon, a variable. So operators like plus, minus, um, uh, and there's a couple of others. Uh, and uh, so if this one variable will be uh, duplicated in all the threads and the, at the, when the threads have all exited, uh, its contents, uh, the contents of that one variable will be added or subtracted from some other roll up value. So uh, uh, OMP is pretty rich. I am, it, and what's really nice about OMP is it is truly very easy to take serial code and turn it into parallel code. OMP also includes um, 
ways of specifying, this is not the proper keyword, but there could be a master thread where one thread is more special than the others and it's allowed to do things that the others can't do. Uh, it allows you to uh, get info about your operating environment. For example, the, num the maximum number of processors. Uh, so the OMP is, is a wonderful package. I suggest you learn it because it's so darn convenient. I mean, it's, it's, quite, it's trivial. There are a number of other uh, technologies which uh, do what OMP does and in some ways they're better, some ways they're not as good. Um, but the key difference between OMP and several of the more modern approaches is that the more modern approaches attempt to blend CPU and GPU. So if you've got a thread um, and it's executing uh, on the CPU, well, gee, you know, uh, why not, if I've got, you know, 1400 cores on my GPU, wouldn't it be nice if I could do some of the work over there too? Well, it's wonderful, it's fantastic. You got all these cores. Um, and, uh, but the downside is it's literally on another computer. So there's, your GPU is a standalone computer that's sitting inside your, the rest of your, the rest of your computer. So it has its own memory. It has its own instructions, has its own compiler. So uh, something like uh, OpenCL uh, will use whatever it is you've got. So if you have only a CPU, it'll parallelize on your CPU. If you have a GPU, it'll parallelize on the GPU. It'll even parallelize on both if you tell it to. Is it, isn't the reason we difficult to learn, at least I know it's CUDA is quite hard and I don't know much about OpenCL though. Okay, the, what makes, yeah, so the, the language uh, CUDA, the language of CUDA and the language of OpenCL is trivial. You already know it, it's C, C and C++. The hard part of using these is getting memory right. Uh, it turns out that a, uh, there are many approaches to how you would lay out memory and your variables and your data in that memory, which will either make it very, very fast or could actually slow it down. Uh, GPU cores uh, don't have access to a global memory space like CPUs do. So um, when you start using those languages uh, in order to parallelize your code, it is terribly important, vitally important, that memory is organ your data is organized just so. Okay? Like if you're trying to do something in the GPU, you need to make sure everything's local and you don't use anything from uh, global variables. Uh, you get you can use some global variables, but for example, um, uh, uh, so GPU cores are organized in a hierarchy and uh, each subtree in this hierarchy can have access to certain amounts of memory. So if you design some vast, uh, vast, vast array, for example, some of the cores can only get access to some of that array. So you don't wanna write an algorithm that is, uh, and data structure, that is assuming that every core can get access to all of the data. Instead, it becomes a challenge uh, to your wisdom and creativity to organize the data in such way that uh, access to the data is as fast as possible, as in fact is even possible at all. Uh, we do have a course on uh, GPU programming, uh, but it's not on the schedule for any time soon. So nobody here will be able to take it. Is it going to show us how to make our own GPUs? Yeah, well, you know, Jordan, I think that this topic has come up before. It's really easy. First, you start with sand, right? So uh, go out and get yourself some sand and uh, uh, a source of heat and uh, presto change a little few x-rays and you're done. Okay. 
then why is it so difficult to find a GPU nowadays? Come on. Uh, because all the, uh, the, the Bitcoin miners uh, are still... Uh, oh, by the way, and, and also it's not just them, but there's a global shortage of all types of silicon right now. Um, yeah. You forgot so, a couple decades of computer research and physics and engineering. What, I did? Yeah, yeah, and probably hundreds of tomes of physics and mathematics that it takes to even begin to understand computer engineering. To Those that are level. easy. It's, it's whatever. Yeah, <laughs> okay. it's whatever. Yeah. It's fair. It's fair. Okay. Engineering is not that easy. <laughs> All right. So uh, OMP and its cousins. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, I'll just mention that NVIDIA, uh, who, are the, who are the biggest makers and players in the GPU market? It'd be NVIDIA and AMD, right? Uh, uh, so Intel? No. Well, uh, so they don't Intel, really care about it, GPUs so much. What? They don't really do GPUs as much. They're trying, I think. Yeah. Well, they're, because, so here's a case where we're benefiting from the shrinkage of the circuit size, which by the way, Intel is, is like last, in last place, it's interestingly enough. Um, so every time, uh, well, Mac, Apple, is using a company, a, a third party called TMSC, I think. Uh, and they are moving on to a four nanometer process, which means the wires are four nanometers wide. Uh, and the smaller you make the wire, the uh, faster the system will be. Um, even at the speed of light, something that's twice as a wire that's twice as long uh, the data will take twice as long to get from one end to the other. Uh, so we're able to push more and more circuitry into the same square footage on the die, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can operate the clock any faster. So there's only so many things that we can do in a given second after all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we talked about pipelining, in which, by the way, is I prepared a pretty cool thing for you all. Um, so I'm going to switch switch topics right now because I'm bored with this one. It's time to move on to something else. So uh, let me, because after all, this uh, I mean, the, this class exists for my benefit. You you just are passengers on the on the Perry bus. Uh, you know, I'm kidding. Right? I'm just talking. maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, okay, so uh, I prepared uh, my what? I have to reapply. That sucks. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, this is public, and uh, let me uh, put it in the chat. Have you taken a look at this? Or I haven't told you about it? You have not told us about it. OK, good. All right, so here's something that's kind of interesting for you to think about. OK. Uh, so modern CPUs are deeply pipelined. So uh, what a pipeline is, is uh, as you imagine, uh, you have different stages in a pipeline and different tasks are being accomplished at each different stage. <coughs> In terms of a CPU, there might be fetching the instruction. So uh, one instruction might be in the process of being fetched. Uh, another instruction, a different instruction, uh, which is more recent, the further, the further down you go in the pipeline, the, old, the older the instruction or the newer the instruction is. Uh, so uh, so in, in, uh, pipeline stages include uh, fetching the instruction, decoding the instruction, fetching the arguments for a, um, uh, a, uh, an instruction, 
um, uh, actually doing the ALU, the arithmetic logic portion of the instruction, updating the program counter uh, as a consequence of having executed the instruction. So all of these stages in the pipeline can be operating on different instructions. Let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to, let's see, am I sharing the whole screen? Uh, okay, we so see I, the GitHub currently. Right, so I, I, now you see the iPad, right? Yep. Okay, so I'm just sharing the whole screen. So, uh, so here's instruction um, um, line 10, line 11, line 12, line 13, okay? So uh, let's do a simple pipeline. So it is fetch the uh, instruction, uh, decode the instruction, and uh, fetch operands, and uh, let's just call it implement the instruction. Okay, so uh, the way that this simple pipeline, come on iPad, hello, thank you. The way that this simple pipeline would work is uh, line 10, execution, uh, uh, instruction 10 is the oldest one. So we might be implementing 10 here, fetching the operands from 11 there, uh, decoding the instruction from line 12, and fetching the instruction from line 13. Okay, so uh, in this simplified example, I have four instructions in flight at the same time. So every clock cycle, uh, 13 would move on to the next, 12 would move down and uh, 11 would move down and 10 is finished. Okay. So pipelining is fantastic. It's a great, great speed up. Uh, the overhead at any given stage in the pipeline is buried in the uh, execution time it takes for all of the uh, uh, stages in the pipeline. The alternative prior to having a pipeline all of these steps had to take place, but it was only one instruction at a time. So without, in this trivial example, without a pipeline, uh, it's gonna, the CPU would be one quarter the speed of this one, which has a four stage pipeline. Does everybody understand that? Okay, now what happens if this instruction is an if statement or a branch, branch greater than, okay? How about that? So what would happen? Uh, well, so what happens to the work? Uh, let's say you take this branch. Well, I, I, actually the idea is so simple. I'm having a hard time uh, articulating it is if there's a branch, you could go in more than one direction, right? You might take the branch or you might not. So here, let's take a look at some in, uh, actual um, instructions. Uh, branch greater than to three forward. I'm just making crap up. Uh, and then um, let's see, move uh, X one, uh, X put, I don't know, put the zero and one and then branch to printf. Who knows, right? And then here's three and there's more instructions. Okay, so depending upon the value of x0 and x1, either the branch is going to come down here or the branch is going to go there. Right? 
Well, what do we do with our pipeline? Uh, we eventually come back to the current code at a specific point. Um, I can't discount what you said because it sounds like what GPUs do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but well, let me say so. Uh, while the while the compare, so let's look at the pipeline right now. This one is being implemented. Uh, this one, I'm. Uh, yeah, let's let's look at the BGD. So this one is being implemented, and this one is fetching operands, and this one is decoding. Right. All at the same time. But what happens if we take the branch? If we take the branch, the later stages in our pipeline are all working on the wrong instruction. Okay, so this, in essence, the CPU is going to make some uh, assumptions. It's going to say, okay, well, I don't know which way this branch, uh, the BGT is gonna go. I don't know if it's gonna be this statement to execute next, or it's gonna be this statement to execute next. I don't know. So I'll assume, let's say, it's gonna be this one. Well, if it turns out that the assumption was wrong, then the work done so far on this instruction is garbage, and the work done so far on that instruction is garbage, waste. So branches have the potential to force all of the stages in your pipeline to become invalid. And when that happens, you know, some CPUs have 12 stages in their pipelines. That means 12 instructions are in process at any given time, which means that uh, if you made the wrong choice in your uh, uh, branch relative to uh, what the CPU is expecting and filling the pipeline with, you may have lost work of 12 instructions. And that's a massive loss. So if statements can slow you down. So I prepared this little document here uh, on this idea of branchless programming. Let's take a look at this trivial example. Uh, this work is based upon a YouTube video found here where uh, the uh, creator of the instructions of this video is using the Intel. I redid it using uh, ARM. Okay, so let's take this trivial example. Uh, there's a 50-50 chance that A is less than B, right? Or uh, it could be even worse. Uh, this says if A is less than B, return A. Let's say there's a 90% chance that B is smaller. So there's a 90% chance that the else will happen. Well, that means there's a 90% chance that your pipeline needs to get flushed. Okay, so let's say it's 50-50. Well, uh, that means there's a 50-50 chance that the work done on returning A will be used, or on the flip side, a 50-50 chance that this work, which is in process, will be thrown away and this work is started after incurring that delay. Okay, so this pipe, the, the point is the pipeline has to be busy doing something. And when there's a branch, it might be busy doing the branch that's not taken, the road not taken. Okay, so how about this? This is the same thing, right? Okay. So uh, on the arm, you might implement that first one uh, compare W0 and W1. 
If it's less than or equal to, then just return W0. So you can skip right to the return. Okay. Now, what if we could eliminate the if statement? Now you, this isn't something that you can do in general, uh, but with short snippets like this, maybe this is some type of calculation. This is some type of calculation. It's not a huge code block. When you're working with these short snippets, you could recode it in such a way so that there is no if statement. Okay, so one of these two expressions will evaluate to a one. And one of these two expressions, the other will evaluate to a zero. So let's say A is less than B. This evaluates to one. So A times one is A, and that's what, uh, uh, add that to B times zero. So the B goes away. Is okay. this what computer does like on a very, like, very, very basic level? And like when you're, when it's comparing, like given two binary numbers, how does it know which one's technically larger? Oh, well, uh, it, it's, it, it's looking at the bits, right? I mean, it's, it, it has circuitry, which is, is interrogating the bits or microcode, I should say, which is interpreting the bits directly. Okay, uh, so now take a look at what the arm does. The arm solves this in a pretty interesting way. So compare W0 and W1, just like you would expect. And then uh, set W2 to a one if the comparison resulted in a less than. So W2 has a one or a zero. So here's A, multiply A by, uh, by a one or a zero. Okay, do the uh, opposite comparison. So now we're working on this one and it's a less than or equal to multiply B by a one or a zero, add the two together and you're done. So this operates with no potential to stall the pipeline. So this function can actually be faster than this one. Because this one can potentially ruin the, the or spoil, invalidate the entire pipeline, where this one cannot. So what do you think? So then would you say that half of the time the second one is faster and half the time the, the prior one is faster? Uh, yeah, yeah, in concept, yes. Uh, it depends upon the values of A and B and whether or not there's any difference in the probability that A is greater or smaller than B. If you do have an intuition on the distribution, you can just program it such that the often case does not flush the pipeline. In Correct. which case, it would be faster than the C set shenanigans. Correct. Correct. And what is what that reminds us of one of the great ideas of computer science is make the common case fast. Okay. 
Uh, and you've seen this before, you know, you, you, when you study the if statement, you have if, else if, else if, else if, else if, and you learned that if you have an intuition as to which one of those cases is going to be co is the is the correct one, usually make that first. It would be silly to make the most common case last. You would have to gone gone through wasted if else if else if else if. So make the common case fast. So if you have an intuition, exercise it. All right, let's take a look. Um, Let's take a look at what uh, the ARM compiler will really do. So this is what you might have thought it would generate. Now, the, uh, I, I am fond of saying to people that uh, the uh, optimizer in your compiler is smarter than you are, is usually smarter than you are. So here's, the, here's how the ARM with O3 optimization, that's what it produces. That's what it produces. So C cell, as opposed to C set, condition select. Uh, it will compare uh, W0 and W1 and put whatever's, whichever one is less into W0 and return. So this also has no branches. So C cell is exactly this right here. All of that one statement is that without branches. Okay, so the moral of the story, branchless programming uh, can be a big win, uh, but keep in mind that optimizers will generally do a better job than you. Let's take a look at a more complicated example. This is to upper. Given a string, a C string, which has a pointer to a char and a length, go through each character, and if it's a lowercase letter, make it uppercase. Uh, by the way, how does that make it uppercase? Uh, the uppercase segment and the um, lowercase segment in ASCII are 32 bits apart. Th 32 values by, apart. Yeah, letters. Yeah. So if you take little a, subtract 32 from it, you'll get big A. Although this doesn't take into account a bunch of things. It doesn't take into account what? It doesn't take into account, like you're assuming that it's not a wide character or anything else. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so Thomas, uh, we'll get to your question in a little bit, OK? OK. Uh, now, when fully optimized, this right here produces 129 lines of assembly language, which is ridiculous. So let's try the same technique that we tried before, where we're going to take um, uh, the original letter times a zero or a one plus the lowercase version of the letter times the opposite condition. So this generates only 44 instructions. All right. So how about this one? Uh, this will also generate about 40 lines, also branchless. So let's try writing it by hand, though. So this is what I came up with. And I bet I can make it a little shorter if I use C cell instead of C set. 
But once again, there are no branches except for, of course, down here in the loop. But in this case, it's unconditional, so. Yeah, there are no, there are no conditions here. So compare my, I don't know, 13 lines, 14 lines to the 120 that the optimizer produced. And yeah, it's possible that you can write much better code than the optimizer. But in general, the optimizer is smarter than you. So my advice to you, strong advice to you is always write code for clarity and let the optimizer worry about the speed. Unless you're talking about the innermost loop of a time critical function and then every clock cycle counts. All right, so. Uh, only optimize, that's in one, another one of the great ideas of computer science is only optimize what needs optimizing. So if you're talking about uh, a function, uh, a calling to upper once in the li entire life of the program, who cares? Uh, remember that optimizers are generally smarter than you are. Uh, sometimes writing branchless code is, uh, uh, does not bring the gains that you uh, were hoping for. And if you do uh, go through some effort to optimize some code, make sure it's only after you figured out that the, the potential win is large and that you do some te timing tests afterwards to prove that you actually made it faster. Okay, but where this really is important, this is really important is when you're writing shaders on a GPU. So why? So I think I've mentioned this. In fact, I'm sure I mentioned this in the last class. On a GPU, each of the cores is executing a warp of 16 threads at the same time. Now, all 16 threads must implement the same instruction at the same time. They all, all 16 threads are in lockstep with each other. So this is where Thomas's comment before that I said sounds like a GPU comes into play. When a warp, uh, let's go back to uh, the I. Yeah, that's, that's right. not what I was asking about, actually. Right, but it sounded like it. So, uh, uh, okay. So let's say you have if condition in your shader, and then you got a whole bunch of code, and then else, and a whole bunch of code. So if within one warp of 16 threads, some of them would choose this and some of them would choose that, what a GPU does to ensure that all threads are executing the same statement at the same time is uh, it evaluates the condition and then suspends any thread that would go this route. So some portion of its 16 threads will execute this. And then those threads suspend. And only those threads which would execute this part continue running. And then when you get to the final brace, all of the threads are launched again or started up again. Okay. So if statements in GPU shaders, you definitely want to avoid. Even going so far is 
you might do the if statement in your C++ code, your higher level language, and then have several different versions of the exact same shader. And you choose which shader to call based upon what the output of the if statement would be. So that way, shader number one implements the true part, the then. Shader number two, a completely different shader, implements the else part. And that way, you have no if statement inside the shader. OK? All right, so uh, speculative execution. Uh, I, I know and uh, worked for both of these men, uh, Mark Hill and Gurinder Soe, uh, are at the university. Where at the, actually, Guri hasn't retired. Um, uh, are you trying to show something on your computer or no? Am I not? Uh, we see the GitHub currently. Yeah, that's what I'm showing you right here. Okay. So this whole idea of speculative uh, in, uh, execution uh, is, was invented by uh, uh, many researchers, among them uh, Mark Hill, uh, retired at uh, uh, Wisconsin, at Madison, and Gurinder Soe, uh, who's uh, still active. Uh, by the way, uh, this speculative execution, I think this is the specter. I don't remember which of the uh, recent CPU flaws uh, that gets exploited, but uh, yeah, this, this is one of the ways that people can exploit the um, um, uh, this speculative execution benefit. Uh, your CPU goes faster, but yeah, there's this possible that somebody could leak data out of your program. Another thing, by the way, do you realize that People can tell, you can implement timing so finely that you can exploit the slowdown of the pipeline to tell which way the code went. So you're trying to reverse a, a black box. Uh, you're trying to reverse engineer black box. Well, you take a, a certain, you go through this branch and you're looking at a branch instruction and you know which way it went. Uh, you can calculate, you know, 78% of the time it goes one way versus the other by actually looking at the time that it takes to execute the branch. That's crazy. That is absolutely crazy. All right, so uh, I imagine this is a new concept for you, this idea of branchless programming. Uh, so I imagine that the idea that an if statement can cause slowdowns may be a new idea for you. Something to keep in mind. I think I might have watched the same video that you linked. I remember going on a whole YouTube rabbit hole about this a while back. Okay. Oh, well, it's good. You have good taste in videos. Mm -hmm. uh, let me um, just say one final word about this. So, so here's some massive loop, right? And this is kind of a restatement of what I said for the sh shaders and GPUs, but I'm bringing it back to normal CPU programming. You have some type of loop, which is going on a lot. You're looping a lot. And buried in the middle of the loop is an if statement. And you, then you've got a bunch of code here, else, and a bunch of code here, and an end of the, of the braces. Um, it can actually be faster to separate the loop into two parallel sets of code. Parallel not meaning that they execute at the same time. But you can, if you can arrange to bring the if statement outside the loop, then 
then you could reformulate your code to be if a loop uh, with no if uh, else the b code loop with no if. So you can actually bring this into your own practice. Even if you're not doing GPU sh uh, shader programming. So Cephas, you uh, uh, shook your head yes. You, you're recognizing the, the idea. Okay, now the next thing I want you to do, Cephas, is to get one of those uh, voice box things and make up, uh, <coughs> give us a, um, uh, speak in a low, you know, computery robot voice, if you're going to keep the goggles on. I could actually do that. Yeah. How are you doing, Jacob? I'm doing pretty good, pretty good. I think he's just taking a lot of notes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Jared, how are you? Good. Okay, you totally get the concepts. Yeah, and that's the second one is faster because you're not looping or you're not doing an if and else every time you do you're like in the loop, correct? Right, right. So we it's not just that you're avoiding the one if statement. It's that you're avoiding the potential to pollute your pipeline. To that you have to discard your pipeline. Gotcha. Okay, Joshua. Yep. All right, uh, Rebecca. Um, so you're talking about like trying to avoid um, not using the pipeline, like using using a pipeline that you don't need to use. Um, so is there a case where you would purposely slow it down um, for optimization or is there or is it more likely that you would um, just code so there is no if and make it easier on the um, um, easier on the CPU? Uh, I'm not sure I'm getting the thrust of your question. Could you restate it? I'm basically saying, is there a scenario where um, you would want the if instead of doing the no if? Um, um, because there's drawbacks and trades to everything. Yes, of course. Uh, one that comes to mind is, let's say you're doing some type of embedded application and uh, your, your coding, out, all of your code has to fit inside of a, uh, uh, a ROM or an EEPROM. Uh, and you simply don't have a, a space for the code um, uh, to, to do two parallel sets of code. Uh, but other than that, no. Can I tell you a story that you reminded of, me of, an anecdote? Uh, the Amiga operating system uh, was uh, largely resident on a read-only memory chip. Right, so, um, uh, and that chip maybe had 256,000 bytes or maybe 64,000 bytes. Um, and uh, uh, they were about to do a new release of the OS and they were 13 bytes too big. And they had already uh, uh, exhausted every single opportunity to reduce the size of the code and the chip had to go to the manufacturer the next day. So no one could think of any way to make the code any smaller until one of the engineers says, I've got the solution. He said, what, 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 what? He said, we go out drinking. Okay, they go out drinking and they come back in after midnight and now the code fits by itself. <laughs> okay, so- How does that work? What? 
so every, from... no, no, no. Oh, Here's what oh. it was. The, this engineer, I believe his name is, uh, if I remember right, Neil Caton, realized that every module that the linker puts the date into every, embeds the date into every code uh, module is in a header. And it was like April, oh, how many days are there in April? April 30, 31? All right, so I, I'm not thinking about it right now. So it was a month that was a long, uh, a long name to the month. And there were two digits in the day. But if they generated the code the next day, the header would include that day's date, which is a shorter name and has only a single digit for the day. So that actually fixed their problem. That's, that's pretty uh -huh. funny. Uh -huh. So the solution was uh, in front of them the whole time. It was go out drinking. I don't, I don't see that. I don't see how that works. Because in general, I imagine it would store it in a constant data structure, not a variable size one. You just have one that held the max because it seems like it require a lot more code to have the data structure you're storing and change bytes with respect to the actual date. What about the C string? I mean, a C string, you know, May 1st is fewer characters than September 29th. Right? I suppose. Mm. And this, this header was present in every module. So they ended up saving a lot of space. And they learned a lesson. OK, let's get back. So branchless coding, new ideas, just opening your, idea, uh, opening your eyes to considering other uh, aspects of your coding practice. All right. So where we also, we were talking about is, uh, we have not covered condition variables yet, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, all right. So a condition variable is another kind of synchronization primitive. All we have looked at right now is the mutex. That's only one of many different types of synchronization primitives. So a condition variable a condition variable uh, uses a mutex, a flag, and a vector, or well, who knows? Maybe it's a Q, maybe it's a vector. Okay. So in the internals of a condition variable, when you try to uh, get access rights to the condition variable, that's based upon the mutex. So uh, if you can get access to the mutex, then you proceed uh, and if you can't get access to the mutex, the mutex is locked, then your task gets put onto the vector of sleeping tasks. At some point, someone who has the, um, well, let me also write down the, uh, so you can either wait on the condition variable, or you can signal one or signal all. So signal all says, every, wake up everyone who's on the vector, who's sleeping on, the, on this vector, and you'll all, they'll all wake up, who knows what order they'll wake up in, 
but then they'll all try to get the mutex and check this flag. I haven't talked about what the flag is for. Signal one says, wake up only one of the sleepers. And the wait is attempt to uh, uh, get the condition variable. Okay, so what does that look like in code? And that would be here. All right, so you've included condition variable. So there's an include. And it's all spelled out. All right, uh, you'd use unique lock because inside the code of the condition variable implementation, it needs to lock and unlock. So it needs the unique lock and not a lock guard. So unique lock. So you try to get the mutex. If you got the mutex, you own the, you own the lock now. Then you have a while loop. While the condition has not been met. Wait. Okay. So also presumably over here, there'd be the signal. So it's always, here are the important parts of a condition variable. Uh, you have to own the lock before you wait for the condition variable. Notice here, you own the lock. If the flag says the condition isn't right, you call wait with the owned lock. The implementation of the wait function will put you to sleep and then unlock the lock. When you are reawakened, you are given the lock back. Okay, so this is the proper way to use a condition variable. Uh, okay, so here's why it works that way. So let's say you wanted to write a uh, parent that waited for a child to run, okay? So this is done without the condition variable. Uh, the parent prints, hello, I'm the parent. It launches the child, and now it wants to wait for the child to finish by busy waiting a loop, a loop a while not done, keep looping. The child would say, hello, I'm the child. And then it would set done equals true. And as soon as done gets set to true, you expect this while loop to break. And then it would print the parent ended. Okay, now what could go wrong with this? Where is the devil in these details? I don't see an obvious problem if you're launching one child. Uh, maybe if it's the wrong one gets it first. Okay. All right, let's scroll down. Uh, 
No. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, maybe the, the the print parent has to happen first because there's no uh, there's no children. You launch the child, and then you start uh, looping. Then the child starts up, sets the flag, and then the parent should come back. Okay, so what's the problem with that? What if the, I'm trying to remember where the problem is. Hello. So the child runs first. The flag is gets set to true. So, but that's also okay. All right, so where's my problem? I feel like if you launched multiple children, then you'd have concurrency issues. But if it's only one child, I don't think it would be a problem. Yeah, I'm not seeing a problem over there. How about this example on screen now? Uh, so what if the parent uh, did the lock and waited? Oh, and oh, oh. Yeah. It's too close to the end of the class to think about this. <laughs> so when we come back on Thursday, we'll have the, uh, um, we'll start up on condition variables again. Let's get to Thomas's question. What was your question? My question was in P7, you have us give the remainder of any, the remainder of, like the list of size to the final vector. Uh-huh. Uh, if there is more than one remainder, like say we have five cores and we're putting in 12, mm -hmm. would the last two go to uh, core five or uh, yeah. string five? Yeah. All right, then yay. Not that it matters. Right, I mean, it's it's the programmer's choice how to deal with a remainder. So sure, give it to the last thread. That's easy enough. Okay, this is project seven. You've gone through seven projects. Good for you. I feel pleased. Wait, 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 wait. wait. What? Wait, didn't we just do project seven? Isn't that one the one we're still doing? That's the one we're currently yeah. doing. The one with the deck? Yeah. So I've assigned seven pro I've had to grade seven of your projects. Ah. I, I mean, I you don't have to grade them. <laughs> no, what? Yeah. It was all hundreds. I should have assigned zero tests and zero uh, projects. Be easy for me. You just grade your based upon. Um, uh, how many letters are in your last name? I don't like that idea. I really don't Why like not? that idea. <laughs> Why not how entertaining we are for you in, to teach to? Mm. Then I think Jarrett uh, would get the A and everybody else would, uh, uh, anyone who has ever spoken gets a lower grade. So Jar Jarrett is like largely, yeah, he agrees. <laughs> Okay. I think I was confused because Thomas used calls. I think he meant to say threads. I did. I did say cores, but I meant to say threads, yada, yada, but mm -hmm. you do get what I mean. Okay. I did thought you were talking about the other project because I saw calls, but I was wrong. Okay. While I'm thinking of it, are there any uh, people here who are seniors next year? I am. Okay, uh, everyone here who is a senior next year or expects to graduate next year, you've all reached out to me via email to be led into the senior seminar, correct? Is there anyone who has not done that? So Cephas, you're in and Jarrett, you're in. 
Okay, nobody else uh, is a senior? Okay. Next year. No, okay, so it would be one more year or two more years. You? Yeah. Pity the man. Yeah, you'll be missed when you're gone. All right, anybody have any questions uh, excluding condition variables? Any questions about your project? Well, uh, my question you probably are going to be talking to me about later. OK, then. Uh, then I'll see you uh, on Thursday. Uh, boy, you know, I'm really looking forward to getting back to in-person barbecues. Yeah. Me barbecues too. these days. Yeah, they're just not the same, are they? We're going to have an extra special one next year for the first one. Yeah, well, in, instead of pizza, we'll just have, I don't know, sushi and lobster and uh, steak and lobster. Yeah, I'd rather have pizza. Uh, you're a real foodie, aren't you? No, I just don't like lobster and I prefer pizza over steak. Mm. Okay, how about steak pizza? What would you do then? I'd rather have a steak burger. Okay. All right, everybody. I'll see you on Thursday. Bye-bye. Okay.